and let's just take a quick moment. Ah, take a breath. So I can get centered. Join me in that, would you? And knowing that this is a perfect moment, a good moment, a moment where I am fully alive, and I affirm for each one of us that we too are fully alive, imbued with the presence of the divine. I know it is in and all around each one of us here this morning. It is in this beautiful garden. It is in the fresh air. Oh, it is in the music. It is in the words. It is in our smiles. And I allow it to just bathe us in this moment right now. That's right. We invite it in and we let it out. For this is a good day. And so it is. So it is. Yeah. So, you know what? We have lots to celebrate and talk about this morning. Um, And we have lots of choices in what we could talk about this morning. And so I just want to point some of that out to you. We could talk about Passover, right? Because we're in the midst of Passover. So we could talk about plagues and firstborn sons. And I could show you my, my grandchildren from my firstborn son. And we could talk about um, blood of the tomb and matzo balls. And we could talk about that. Or we could talk about Easter. We could talk about crucifixion, death by the cross. We could talk about tombs, stones, resurrection, ascension. Right? We could talk about whether the Last Supper was really a Seder. Talk about that. We could talk about the resurrection story is not unique to Christianity. How many people know that. There are resurrection stories going way back, right? Way back. Um, uh, Osiris, uh, Adonis, Achilles. um, There's lots of them. Lots of those stories predating Christianity. Um, How about Easter? The very word that we say, Easter Sunday, where does that come from? A star. A star. A star. A however we pronounce her name, right? Um, A goddess, spring goddess, goddess of the equinox. Um, German goddess of spring, Grimm wrote about her in 1835. He said a divinity of, of radiant dawn, upspringing light, a spectacle of joy and blessing. Um, so, of course, obviously that's pre-Christian. And the whole idea of Easter eggs, decorating Easter eggs, the games associated, the egg rolling, the egg hunts, all that is, is pagan, and we still do it today. Um, fertility, the, the Easter bunny, fertility, growth, that's related to spring, so lots of things we could talk about this morning. Or we could talk about whether you're having lamb or ham. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian. I will partake of neither. Or we could talk about the fact that Moses was really the first to download files from the cloud on a tablet. <laughs> I know, that's a good one, isn't it? That's a good one. That's a good one. I wish I could say that. We could also talk about the fact that yesterday was 420. And you know, I was wrong all these years. It has nothing at all to do with Bob Marley. It was a group of people, group of stoners in California. It was. It was a group of stoners in California in 1971 that started that whole thing, and we're still celebrating it today. So don't ever underestimate your power. Don't ever underestimate your power. And then tomorrow's Earth Day. But, yeah, yeah. And we're going to talk about that next week. And Annie's going to do, does everybody know Annie Cedarberg back in the room? She's going to do a meditation for us out in the garden. So, again, lots and lots of things we could talk about. What I'm choosing to talk about this morning is what my mentors, Ernest Holmes and Ralph Waldo Emerson, talked about is that the fact of my God is a living God. My God is the God of life. My God is present, not dead. And that's what I choose to talk about this morning because I want to see how it's relevant to my life today. Um... And in a new thought, you know, we don't subscribe to a literal interpretation of the Bible. And in my experience, when I say it less literal, it's more real, though. My understanding of the stories in the Bible are so much more real and alive to me today than they were 
when I was a Catholic and I was studying and, you know, a Christian, right? So I, that's really interesting to me. Um, I, I think we can have an experience of the story. And when you have an experience of something, at least if you're kinesthetic, it's, uh, it's really valuable. It's a valuable thing. So anyway, that's where I'm taking it. And um, <clears throat> Joseph Campbell said, and I'm paraphrasing him here, he said, half the people in the world think that metaphors of their religion are facts. And the other half of the people think that metaphors, well, they consider themselves atheists, and they think that metaphors um, are, are lies, are not true. So I think there's a middle ground there, you know? I think that there's an alternative. Um, at least there is an alternative for me. Bishop Shelby Spong, has anybody read him? He's, oh my God, he's so fabulous. He's an Episcopal priest, a bishop, and he's retired now. I think he's in New Jersey. And he's got many books. I've got uh, three of his books right here. And in his book, Resurrection, Myth, or Reality, he says that the more he looked into the Easter story, and he's a Bible scholar, again, written many books on the Bible, and, and he became fascinated with the Easter story. So he really delved into the Easter story, and it's really become his life work. So uh, all these books talk about the Easter story. And uh, he said that, that he took an exodus then from the traditional Christian interpretation of it once he really started looking into the history and, and all of that. And so his interpretation is that the disciples saw the way that Jesus died as the way Jesus lived. So I'm going to let you percolate on that as I talk this morning. Because they became transformed. I've, I've, I've read some really interesting stuff about what happened for them when they, when they saw him, when he came to them, and how they were themselves transformed. It's really such an ama amazing story about them, the people, and what happened to them because of their faith. And, and, and look, we still know about this story today because of their work, really, because they kept talking about it, and they were so on fire about it. So he lives on. The story of Jesus lives on for people who I believe who love greatly, people that love greatly, people that love uh, selflessly and openly, people that accept all other people, people that give freely of themselves, people that forgive readily. Those were the lessons of his life, I think. And so Shelby Spong, and I conclude, I agree with him, he said, so life, how we, how we do it, how we live life, is more powerful than death. And so I'm going to ask us really consider that this morning and to rise up, to rise up in a way that um, is maybe new for us, and certainly first in our consciousness. The true significance of Easter, as Ernest Holmes says, is not that dead men live again, but that living men never die. Living men and women never die. Now, we believe in eternality, continuity, and an abundance of life forever unfolding itself in, as, and through each one of us. There's an endless creativity. There's an infinite intelligence. And it's birthing itself all the time with every breath in, as, and through each one of us. And so we don't really know what happens after death. I mean, we don't really know, right? Not the kind of knowledge, again, that Einstein talks about because that's an knowledge from experience. And so, but we do know what a life lived well is and a life that feels not well lived is. We know those things. And so life matters. All life matters. It matters to us and we influence people around us. Is a, a great... Um, uh, uh, spread of our own personal energy all the time. We're always influencing people around us. Thich Nhat Hanh said in his book, Living Buddha, Living Christ, that when we understand and deeply practice the teachings and the life of Buddha or the life and the teachings of Jesus, we penetrate the door and enter the abode of the living Buddha and the living Christ. And the eternal then presents itself to us. When we enter into it, 
then it presents itself to us. See, th these lives, Buddha's life, these great lives, they're still influencing us today, and I think that that's a really magnificent thing for us to consider. You know, last month I read this little thing about Thich Nhat Hanh. He's 92 right now, and he's preparing for death. He's gone home, and he's, he's preparing for death. And so he says, I don't want any monuments. Don't build any monuments to me. That's not what it's about. He said, let your teacher be alive in you. Let these teachings be alive in you. And this is what the Buddhist idea of resurrection is. To them, the idea of resurrection is that the teachings come so alive to us that we live it from that place, that in heart and mind of the student, Buddha is alive or Jesus is alive. That's what resurrection is. So we resurrect the life within us and live from that place. You know, too often I think we allow silly inconveniences, we allow uh, disgruntled arguments, um, fears, worries, stop us from living that grand life, whatever it is, right? Whatever that big dream is for us. You know, if I had thought that way, and I probably still occasionally do, but if I had thought that way, we wouldn't be sitting here right now. And we wouldn't have almost a full room, right? Yeah, if I had had fears or allowed somebody's idea what I should be stop me from being what I want to be and what I want to do. And so m this journey isn't over, mine isn't over, and, but getting to today has, has had some challenges and I've had some losses. Um, I have, I've had to say goodbye, let go, I've had some death around what was my previous life, right? I've lost some relationships. And that's painful. It's painful to go through. But yet there's something greater that has to be released. And any time we move into the greater, there has to be some sort of death, some sort of letting go. And Easter can be that powerful symbol for all of us. And so I call us into this idea of personal and spiritual transformation. It's a so story of radical change, radical change. You know, um, it's not just a historical event. It's an event that's happening with every breath we take. So we can ascend this morning and have an ascension in consciousness. An ascension in consciousness, right? It's an opportunity for all of us to rise and shine. I think that Jesus was the ultimate science of mind practitioner. You know, he's transcended form, conditions, circumstances. And you too have. I know you have. All of us have. You've riven, risen above the, the fray. But there's probably still something that keeps you from the next step or the next step, right? Because we're always forever wanting to expand outward and have a greater expression of this thing life you know I have too I have risen taller because of things that I've gone through I used to be three foot five <laughs> really. so I've had a few dark nights just saying I've had a few dark nights I've had a few uh, nights with uh, a lot of wine and a lot of whining um, <laughs> been through a divorce and I had two children at the time, and um, we had a business that we shared, and a house and family and friends that are gone, that were gone after that. Everything changes. There's drastic change when that happens. So it's tremendous loss. And I will tell you that I consciously stayed nailed down through it. I cried. I drank wine, and I cried. That was my path. Um, <laughs> not recommending it for everyone, but it was my path. And, um, and, and I really do feel like I, I rose. So people that knew me before and after, um, I feel like I really did that work. I did the forgiveness work. I felt the pain. I went through it to get on the other side of it. And I encourage all of us, if there's something that you're going through right now, I, you know, a, a loss, a, a, a separation, um, s uh, some challenge that feels really big. I encourage you to go through it and feel every little piece of it. 
because there's life on the other side. There's something really magnificent on the other side. I would not have this incredible marriage to Bobby had I not gone through that, had I not known what I deserved. Yeah, I wouldn't have this. Yeah. So it's worth it. It's worth it. Joseph Campbell again, he said, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. I believe it 100%. I believe it 100%. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek 100%. Yes. You know, whatever the darkness, the pain is that you're afraid to go through, do it. And you don't have to do it alone. You know, for me, I had incredible support at that time that I was going through my divorce. Um, I was at CPL at the time, and I was in a namaste group. And it was the first time we had namaste groups. And um, it was the very first session, and I was in with Carol Linehan, and, and Charlie and Virginia McWaters were in there, and Jay and Barbara Leveroni. And I was supported. Those people called me. They checked in on me. Um, so I didn't do it alone, and you don't have to do any of this stuff that seems hard alone. That's why I'm doing this. I want us to have a community. I want us to know that we're never alone. We're never alone. We're never alone. In, uh, th in the news this week, there's a young man in uh, Tampa Bay, a teen in Tampa Bay, and he's graduating. He's upcoming graduation from high school, and um, he's graduating at the top of his class, and Yale and Stanford, did you share it? That was it, Jennifer. Yeah, I picked it up on Facebook. So he, he's, you know, nice colleges are, are competing for his attention, right? And so, but that's not his real accomplishment. His real accomplishment is that he's overcoming growing up in a trailer filled with drugs and crime to where he had to step over people to get to school in the morning that were passed out in his trailer. And so he was removed at the age of nine and spent six or seven years in foster homes and children's group homes until his math teacher saw him in the hallway and he said, I'm leaving, um, I'm gonna be moved to another home and I'm leaving um, this district, the school district. And she said, you know, I'm trained as a foster parent, let me talk to my family. And he's been with her for six or seven years now, I think. And so, um, was he buried or was he planted? Was he buried or was he planted? There's rebirth, right? There's always rebirth. Romans 8, 11 says the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. If you have the courage to find it, if you have the courage to find it, if you have the will and the desire to do that work, because this isn't magic, it's not always easy, but there is this power and this presence that we can use, that can live through us, in us, as us. Again, Spong said there is a life in Jesus, in all of us, that is appealing, transcendent, open, full, free, and it escapes all human limitation. I believe that too. I believe that too. So after my divorce, I went through school. I did 10 years of school. I did my undergrad. I did, uh, you know, well, first I got married, and then I did my undergrad, and then I did my master's degree. I mean, there's a new life here. I don't even look like the same person. Do I look like the same pretty? I'm way prettier now, aren't I? <laughs> I'm way prettier. Look at me. Shell's known me since I was a kid. So um, here you go. Love rises above every disagreement every human barrier, every human prejudice. Love rises above. Love is life affirming. Love is beyond religion. Love is beyond faith traditions. Love is beyond rules, the ideas of acceptable behavior, right and wrong, right and wrong. Love's beyond all that. Remember last week I talked about Viktor Frankl. Nothing's greater than love, he said. How about that? So the life of Jesus displayed that kind of love. So are we willing to be so vulnerable? 
to love so unconditionally? Can we have a spiritual community that demonstrates real inclusion? I mean real inclusion, not just color, not just sexual orientation, sexual identification, age, ethnicity, economic diversities. Can we do that? I think we can. I absolutely think we can. And I believe it's imperative that we do. I believe it's imperative that we do that. Do we dare live openly, freely, fully, completely, unapologetically? Don't you love that word? I love that word. Unapologetically, be who you are. Unapologetically, be who you are. Do what you came here to do. That presence within you animates all life. And everything and anything that you want to do that's held in your heart right now, everything. Claim your right and your ability to define who you are. Obviously, Jesus didn't wait, right, for somebody to define him. He defied the odds, defined himself. We can have that same experience. But we have to risk love, and we have to dare living our holiest self. Our holiest self, that self with the capital S. Yeah. So we have to go deep into ourselves to do that. We go deep into ourselves to find God, yes. You know that. Those of you that meditate know that. That's where we touch the infinite, the eternal. That's where we do it. Let's do that now. Let's just take a breath. Let's take a breath. Let's, let's take a really deep, slow, long breath in. And release it. And another really deep, long, slow breath in. Release it. And find your comfort spot. Just settle in to where you're completely comfortable in this moment. Being still. Being present. Knowing that the eternal, the infinite, the all good, is right here, right now, in your very breath. This universe is vast. Feel that spaciousness, that expansiveness. That limitless gift of life itself. And from that vastness, from that open space, no boundaries, no borders, we recognize that the one source of all life brings itself into the point right where you are, right within each one of us to the point of our own individual consciousness. That is amazing. There is only one, and that one has diversified itself into the many, into the diverse. And it is here that we begin in this awareness, in this consciousness, that there is an ultimate connection and a communion We're never without that. We're never separate. We're never isolated. The creator, the creative process, and creation itself is all one.
And so repeat this to yourself. Love and I are one. Love and I are one. I am love. Love, life flows through, through me now, freely. Life, love flows through me now. I am held in love. I am immersed in love. I am filled with love. I am love. And in this place, we lay down our burdens. Old stories, behaviors and beliefs of separation, feelings of isolation from God, from our true self, from our true nature, from others. We release here in the presence of love the patterns of thinking that hold us back, that keep us confined. And it is here that we release the splendor of the love and the life that is ours. This moment is perfect as every moment leading up to this one has been perfect. No regrets, no judgments. It is perfect. You are exactly where you are supposed to be. Acknowledge that and accept that. And give yourself permission. As you release limiting thoughts, anything that's left, anything that keeps you feeling small, Breathe it in, feel it, and release it. Let it go. Let it go. And on the next breath, breathe in that lightness, that freedom. Commit now with me to a life that is free and full, to a life that is lived abundantly, to a life that is lived in a greater way than ever before, to a magnificent life, to a life of love, to a life lived unapologetically as who you are. Breathe in this intention. Feel it and breathe it out, knowing that you make a tremendous impact in this world. The world is not the same without your gift. We've planted the seed in the fertile soil. Pay attention to all the thoughts rising up. Let go of those that don't serve you and embrace those that do. We have everything we need, each one of us. We are sourced and resourced and have everything we need. Every door is opened. Every pathway is made clear. Everything we need now to live the life abundant is ours. I claim this truth, and so be it. We now rise and shine.